You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 1, Romans 1 will be looking at verses 18 through 23. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. And as we we think of where we are as a nation or a society, as we come more and more into a a post, I don't want to say a a post-Christian nation, because I don't really know that we ever really were a Christian nation. Uh, But as we have more and more forsaken the influence of Christianity and our moral moorings over the years, uh, many have looked at our society and have thought because of of all the wickedness and the growing wickedness that they see all around them, uh, they have proclaimed that, you know what, Christ's return must be soon. And they talk about Christ's return as if it, it will be tomorrow because as we see the wickedness, how can God continue in patience, and not bring his judgment to this world and to this society. Now, do not get me wrong in what I'm going to say next. Do not think that I am saying that Christ is not going to return, because that is not what I'm saying. His return, for sure, is imminent. But often, when people say this and they they think that Christ's return must be soon because of all the wickedness we see in society, I think that what is motivating that speech, that there is a few things amiss in it. One, I think that in saying such things, we far underestimate the long-suffering and patience of our God. We see in 2 Peter chapter 3 that God's patience means salvation for all of God's elect. And God is a God who saves, who delights in saving. And not one whom the Father has given to the Son will be lost. For Christ has secured their salvation. And all of God's chosen will trust in Christ. And so God's patience endures. Now again, I am not saying that that day of wrath is not coming. Because it is. That day when Christ will return and he will lay to waste all of his enemies with just the word of his mouth. That day is coming and and so we must be alert and be ready. But also too, I think in, in this mindset, very often... And looking out into the world and seeing all the wickedness that is in the world, we have a tendency to look out as if the wickedness is only out there. And we fail to realize the truth of God's word that tells us that wickedness out there is really no more than the wickedness that is in here. In ourselves. See, we don't like to think that way. Because there are things out in the world that we like to uh, mull over with disgust and think, I would never do that, and I would never be that way. Uh, But the truth is, we all have the same propensity for sin. All of us. And the truth is, the only reason that we are not as wicked and don't do as sinful things as others do or what we see in the world, the only reason we are not as bad as we could be is because of God's grace restraining sin in us. It is not because of any goodness that may be found in ourselves, because there is none. The only righteousness that anyone can have is the righteousness that is outside of themselves, that can come, that does come by faith in Jesus Christ. It is, as we talked last week, the righteousness that is from God through Jesus Christ. 
And then another error I think there is in this thinking is that in that thinking, we're only expecting wrath to come in the future. When our text this morning tells us that there is a sense in which God's wrath is already being poured out. As we see, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And in this, again, it shows the total sinfulness of all of mankind. Last week, uh, we went over Paul's thesis to this letter. Uh, The very thing that uh, he will defend for the next 11 chapters. And we saw last week that Paul was eager to preach the gospel in Rome for, as he said, he is not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, Despite the response to the gospel of so many, uh, despite how time and time again in delivering the gospel to the Gentile world, his life was put on the line and he suffered so much, despite how it was considered a foolish message to the surrounding culture, Paul nonetheless was not ashamed of the gospel. And so that's what we went over last week, as he explained why he was not ashamed. And what I want to do now, by way of review, is show how what we went over last week flows into what we're talking about here this morning. And so again, we saw that Paul was eager to preach the gospel in Rome. And I hope that's big enough to see. I kind of had some trouble putting it in the PowerPoint. I'm not very tech savvy, and uh, I didn't have the opportunity to check it out. But... We see that Paul, again, he's eager to preach the gospel. Why? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then as we went over, he explained why he's not ashamed of the gospel. And we see Paul was not ashamed for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And everyone who believes is to the Jew first, again, because the priority of the gospel is to the Jews and also to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. That the gospel is for the whole world without distinction. And so again, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And he went on to explain that it is the power of God, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, and it's revealed, as the English Standard Version puts it, from faith for faith. And so again, He's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God into salvation, and it's the power of God into salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. But why is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel? Why is that so necessary? Well, that's what we get into this morning. That's what we see here. That it's necessary for the righteousness of God to be revealed, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And that's what makes the gospel necessary. That's what Paul lays out here. That's why in the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, or you could say the righteousness from God, is revealed. Because the wrath of God is revealed. And so as we think about this, let's, let's read our text here for this morning. And again, we're going to go back to verse 16, and we're going to read straight through to verse 23 for the flow of the text. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so we see here, again, the need for the righteousness from God to be revealed. For God's wrath is being revealed. And I, I believe that's, that's a good way to translate it. It's being revealed. Uh, the, the Greek verb for revealed is a present passive indicative verb. And so therefore we should understand it as saying that God is continually pouring out or revealing his wrath. And so the righteousness from God is necessary. As God's wrath demonstrates, mankind is not righteous. Mankind does not have a right standing before God in of themselves. And Paul is going to continue to unfold this idea as we begin this section here in verse 18, and the section carries on through chapter 3, verse 20. Paul shows in all of this that man is utterly sinful. And being sinful, mankind has no power in themselves to save themselves. So the power of God to save in the gospel is necessary. And all of mankind, being sinful, we have no righteousness in ourselves. Yet, the problem is, God demands righteousness. And as we, we look at this here, I think it's significant that the Apostle Paul starts here as he is defending the truth of the gospel, as he's defending his thesis there in verses 16 and 17. He starts here as the word gospel means good news. And to really understand that this is good news, and to really understand how good the good news is, we actually have to start with the bad news. And seeing how bad the bad news really is helps us to understand all the more how good this gospel truly is. Because the bad news is that, in of ourselves, we are all under the condemnation and wrath of God. Because we are all sinners before the Holy God. And just as Paul begins here with the bad news to defend his thesis and so explain the gospel, so too as we proclaim the gospel in our evangelism, we too must start here. Because people need to understand why they need to come to Jesus Christ by faith. They need to know God's demand for righteousness and that they have none in of themselves. And so that being the very reason they need to come to Christ. People give all kinds of reasons of why we should come to Christ. All kinds of invitations. And although there may be, and there is, many reasons why we must come to him and continue to come to him, we must first come to him because we need righteousness, and he is our righteousness. We don't come to Christ for health and wealth. We do not come to him to help me feel better about myself, according to how I define what it is to be better. Or to, so that I can uh, just have the strength to, to really do it all myself and pull myself up by my own bootstraps, to be encouraged by him. We see, too, Jesus is not some self-esteem boosting, self-help guru. It's not who he is. That's not why we come to him. You know, who he is is Lord. And your Lord demands righteousness. So that's why we need him. That's why we must call others to trust in him. And that's why Paul starts here with the wrath of God and the sinfulness of man. And that's why our evangelism must start here as well. Because the gospel is not about what I can do to obtain God's favor or what I can do to work out and to accomplish my own salvation. No, the gospel is all about what God has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is also not about how good I think I am. 
No, the gospel is really all about how good God is. And so really, it's all about him. It's all about who he is and what he has done, that he would receive all the honor and all the glory. We see because God is truly good. And as Paul Washer has pointed out, that is really the devastation of the gospel. Because it raises the question, what is a good God to do with me who's not good? That's exactly what we see as we come to verse 18. What is a good God to do? Pour out his wrath. Because a good God must deal justly with all that is unjust and unrighteous, or else he is not good. And for us who are not good, we must be confronted with this very thing. Now, before we go any further here, uh, there are those who ask an excellent question of this text. Uh, They ask, what exactly is in view here for Paul in verse 18 when he talks about the wrath of God? And John MacArthur lays out five different aspects of God's wrath. Uh, One is the eternal wrath of God, which is hell, which is the lake of fire, where all of those who are not made right by faith in Jesus Christ before God go to pay the infinite price for their infinite offense against the infinitely holy God. That is his eternal wrath. Second, there is the day that is coming known as the day of the Lord. Uh, This time when God's wrath is poured out on the earth in a destructive and, and devastating way, pouring out that wrath on the unbelieving world. And the third, MacArthur mentions the, quote, cataclysmic wrath, referring to the flood or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fourth, there's the idea of God's wrath as the consequences of our sin, which is the idea of reaping and sowing. And then fifth, we have God's wrath that turns sinners over to their sin pulling back his common grace that restrains sin, giving them up to the natural outworkings of their sinful heart. And I would argue that's the aspect of God's wrath that we see here in Romans 1.18. Because as we keep going through this, this passage, and we keep going through this section, as we will next week and the week after that, on right through to chapter 3, we see this idea of God turning people over to their sin. We see, for instance, in verses 24 to 25, it says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And verse 26 says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. In verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to to a debased mind, to do what ought not to be done. But now, whatever aspect of God's wrath is in view, uh, one thing we must understand about God's wrath is that God's wrath is his anger against all that opposes his holiness. It is that anger that is a result of his love for all that is good, just, and holy. So he hates all that opposes his holiness and is unjust. And far from wrath that is anything like our human wrath, which is more often selfish and is very often an uncontrolled eruption that may strike anyone who is around them, God's wrath instead is a pointed anger poured out with precision and rises in defense of all that is good and right and holy against all that is wicked and unjust. This God of wrath is a holy God, and therefore his wrath is holy. God's wrath is poured out on all the unrighteousness of mankind. 
mankind who is not righteous. So again, we see this, this right, this wrath of God is revealed, or you could say is, is uncovered, or it's made known from heaven. God rules over the universe as he is the only sovereign enthroned in heaven. And as the sovereign king, he reveals his wrath. And he reveals his wrath from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Or you can translate that there as God's wrath revealed against the irreverence and wickedness of men. It's all of our rebellion. It's all of our sin. It's all of our our lawlessness breaking God's standard of what is good and what is right. For every time since the garden that we have not trusted God in all that he has said, we have forsaken his way to follow our own way. For every wicked thought and desire, every act that was in opposition to the glory of our great God who made us for himself, though we live for ourselves, and therefore put ourselves in the place of God, Every time we have done so, we have sinned. We have violated God's standard. And since in sinning we have put ourselves in the place of God in our lives, this is why R.C. Sproul calls sin cosmic treason. And he's right to do so. Matter of fact, R.C. Sproul says this. He says, sin is cosmic treason. Sin is treason against a perfectly pure sovereign. It is an act of supreme ingratitude towards the one to whom we owe everything, to the one who has given us life itself. Have you ever considered the deep implications of the slightest sin, of the most minute peccadillo? What are we saying to our Creator when we disobey Him at the slightest point? We are saying no to the the righteousness of God. We are saying, God, your law is not good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority does not apply to me. I am above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. Do we see how our sin is rebellion against God? Even the slightest sin? How R.C. Sproul can call it cosmic treason? And the truth of the matter is, each and every one of us are guilty. Each of us have incurred, then, God's wrath with each act and attitude of irreverence towards God and every unloving word and thought and deed towards people who were made in his image. We've kindled God's wrath against us. And his wrath is against all mankind who, as Paul says here, by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. By our unrighteousness, we, we suppress the truth. It's not that truth can't be known, as, as some philosophers claim. It's not that truth is relative. You know, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and, you know, whatever whatever's true for you, that, that's for you, and, and this is my truth, and, you know, we, we should view them as equal to each other. They're just as, just as right, because truth is relative. It's just, it's just up to you what your truth is. You know, God's Word says that's, that's, that's malarkey. That's hogwash. There is truth absolute truth, and God has made this truth known. But we suppress the truth by embracing our sin. And the idea of the word suppressed here is to press down. Uh, some have used the illustration of a spring. And so you have the spring that is, is pushing up, and, and so you press it down. And that's what we do with the truth. When we choose our sin, we we press down the truth, out of sight and out of mind, so that we can have our sin. It's not that truth cannot be known, it's that we deny truth. And that we do not approach the, the seeking out of truth without bias. Now look at verse 19, where Paul explains why it is 
mankind suppressing the truth as opposed to not having access to truth. Verse 19 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And we see in verse 20 that it tells us God has shown what can be known and, and specifically what can be known about himself. He has shown it through creation. And so it is, as Ray Comfort has so well put and so simply put, creation demands a creator. We know that. We know that logic. Whenever we see something that's clearly been designed, clearly is, is engineered with, with intelligence, we don't look at it and say, wow, what an accident that was. You know, so many people give the illustration of a watch. No one thinks that the pieces of a watch just, just happen to come together and through natural processes started telling time. No, we know the truth. We know creation demands a creator. Look at the vastness of a clear starry night. I see the beauty of landscapes and how they change with the seasons and the variety of animal life and the uniqueness of each kind. And on and on we can go on how creation screams that there is a creator. And contrary to popular belief, advancements in science and new discoveries have not turned away from the idea of a creator, but instead have only secured the notion. For even as we look at the intricate details of the human eye, and all that must come together in order to create sight, it is a vast wonder and marvel of engineering that the theory of evolution just cannot explain. If evolution is a development of, of mutations, of, of certain characteristics that cause a species to be better fit to survive, then the development of the eye would never have come to be. And the microscopic amoeba from the primordial ooze would have never developed sight for eyes are so intricately complex and the necessity of every part together as they are intertwined in their working and all the details that must be the case for the eye to produce sight. Natural processes and evolution could never bring this about because as one mutation happens, for a sight to come about, you need all the other pieces working together. That's how the eye works. And so the idea of evolution falls flat on its face. Therefore, you must be completely sold out to the idea from the start and to bring this preconceived notion to the evidence to see that's where it leads. It leads to an accident of natural processes. Let's face it, to pretend that anyone approaches science and evidences with complete neutrality is really just a joke. None of us do that. And that's why the evolutionist and the creationist can view the same evidence and come to very different conclusions. Because we all view that evidence through our worldview, a worldview that is packed with preconceived notions. But it's not that there is no evidence there. It's not that the truth has not been made known. It's just a question of what lens do you look at the evidence with? And the lens that does not want there to be a holy, sovereign God over all, but wants self to be the sovereign, to have our sin without accountability, without divine authority, that will be a lens that looks at the evidence and concludes there is no God as we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. And so we see then in verse 20, God having made known all that can be known about him through creation, that he has made known his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, he's made them clearly perceived So making himself known through what we call natural revelation, as opposed to through the scriptures, special revelation, 
he makes known his, his attributes through creation. For instance, his invisible quality of eternal power. As God has brought all things that we see and don't see in creation, he has brought it all into being as clearly designed, not something that exploded and became by accident the organized everything we know today, but it was made. And to make it and sustain it all in all of its wonder and vastness takes an omnipotent God, an all-powerful God. And through creation, there is also the revelation of his divine nature. As in creating this universe, he put his glory on display for all to see. Again, creation screams that there is a creator. It demands it. As God's glory is seen through his creation. And David points this out in, in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. And he says, "...the heavens declare the glory of God." And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And so because this is true, because God has put his glory on display through creation and has made his power known, Paul says then that mankind is without excuse. No one will be able to stand before their creator in judgment and say, I didn't know. I didn't know. I I didn't have the chance to find out. No, no one will say that. For God has made the knowledge of himself plain, but they have chosen their sin, and so in unrighteousness suppress the truth. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul asserts there in verse 21 that mankind actually knows of God and of the one true God. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. God has made himself known. Mankind knows of God. Creation gives the innate knowledge of God, and yet man still rejects him. And in our rejection, we have not given God the honor, or that word could also be translated as glory. We have not given him the honor or the glory that he alone deserves. We have not sought to glorify him with our lives. And yet there is nothing and no one who should be honored and glorified in our lives as he is. He is supreme as all creation has its start with him, and all creation has its end with him. He is so great and so holy and so good. He is worthy of all of our lives being all about him. He has created all that is to put his glory on display. And yet we reject him and refuse to honor him. And in our rejection, not only do we refuse and fail to honor him as we should, we also fail to give him thanks. And we should just think and understand what a crime that in itself is. That we would not give God thanks. He has given us our very lives. That we owe him everything. We just think of his common grace, giving good things to all, even his enemies. Providing food and nourishment and enjoyment in it giving sun and rain and all of the blessings that each one enjoys in life. To fail to give him the honor and thanks that he deserves should be seen as a high crime. To give him honor and thanks is to make him the proper object of our worship, which again alone he is worthy of. But instead, mankind rejects In rejecting him, Paul says, they become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The word thinking here refers to man's reasoning. In order to reject what is plain, to deny the the living God, one must turn to faulty reasoning. And so they pervert their reasoning to do what is insensible, 
And so they begin to reason in futility as they have godless reasoning. And so that then man's hearts become engulfed in spiritual darkness. The heart often refers to the inner person. It refers to the place where one's emotions and desires and reasoning and will takes place. And very often, the heart is used to represent the whole person. And so I would argue that as we read this here, this is the first glimpse of Paul's teaching in the letter of Romans to the total depravity of mankind. That all of us, apart from God's grace, are sinful through and through. Sin corrupts and touches every aspect of us so that there is nothing good and pleasing to God that we can do. Nothing that is right and just. Even the things that we would consider good, it's tainted by our sin with wrong motives and false motives. For the only good motive is really that which seeks to glorify God in all that we do. So we see the depths of man's depravity, full of spiritual darkness. On this, Steve Lawson says this, Unregenerate man defiantly rejects the knowledge of God, thereby plunging into mental dullness, emotional despair, and spiritual depravity. His thinking becomes darker and his will unable to choose rightly. And what does the depraved man do, rejecting what is obvious about God in his futile reasoning, his futility in all that he speculates and and thinks. And so even as they claim to be wise, they're fools. They're fools. For for instance, we see that, that man is not able to distinguish all that is right and all that is wrong and all that is true and all that is false. And all the more as God removes his hand of grace that restrains sin, it just grows in futility. For instance, for a a long time, the the abortion debate was predicated on the question, when does human life begin? We don't know. But now, largely, that's not the debate. There really isn't much of a debate today. For more and more people fully admit that what is in the mother's womb is a human life. But they don't care. If the mother's career or convenience or desire for promiscuity is in danger, then the child can be terminated. And we show that we do not know the value of human life at any stage. But how can we? When we deny that human life was made in the image and likeness of their creator and was made with the most and the highest value and purpose of glorifying him who created them. How can we continue to uphold the idea of the value and dignity of human life at any stage if we're just cosmic accidents? And then what value is there in any aspect of human life? It's all torn down. It's all degraded. That's why we see the whole claim of confusion. I don't believe we don't actually know this. The whole confusion over gender, whether you're male or female. We're actually told it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter what you are. All that matters is what you feel you are, what you want to be on any given day. We see how this has degraded the value of human life to the point that we're even mutilating our kids. How wicked. How foolish. But we claim we're wise. (laughs) 
No, Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And we see this, this plunging down to the depths of depravity as we come to verse 23. That as they became fools, Paul says, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. When God has been rejected, when the revelation of his truth is suppressed, which every person does apart from his grace, then idolatry is the result in many, many ways and in many forms. We exchange the immeasurable greatness of the infinite holy God with an infinitely lesser thing. And this is really what we do every time we choose our sin. Every time we give ourselves to something other than God and put those things in the place of God in our lives, giving those things or those people uh, the priority of our lives that God alone deserves, or seating those things on the throne of our affections as only God should be, and therefore we give those things our worship. We exchange the greater glory for the infinitely lesser thing. We are fools. And this tr foolishness is true of all of us. As all of us in of ourselves reject God. And for man's rejection of God, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodlessness ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men. And so my question to you is, is, do you know that? Do you know that there is wrath, real wrath, that is stored up against you? For you, like me, are a vile and wicked sinner. Let me ask you this. Can, can you say that you are vile? Can you say that about yourself? Or do you, like most people, want to claim your own goodness? Sure, there are all kinds of, of things that we can point to to try and justify our claims to being good. But the sin in our darkened hearts touches everything, even that which we would consider good. It infects all of our selfish motivations. So all we can do is boast in ourselves and pat ourselves on the back and get of ourselves the glory when God is the only one who deserves all the glory. We see here, again, there is no more wickedness out in the world than the wickedness that is right here in each and every one of us. And I know this is not a, a fun passage to go through. Uh, this is not a fun section of Romans as we go all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. But it's necessary. And I would argue this is one reason why it is so important that we are committed to the regular diet of the church being verse-by-verse verse teaching through whole books of the Bible. Because when we're committed to that, then when we come to passages that we might, we might rather just skip, or that we're worried, well, you know, people don't really want to hear so much about how wretched they are, that the commitment to going through whole books verse-by-verse verse, should keep us from that temptation as we seek to honor God as a church and preach the whole counsel of God. See, I, I know people don't want to hear about their wretchedness, but if we can't see that we are wretched sinners and not good, we're never going to understand and we're never going to fully appreciate the gospel. Instead, we may even acknowledge who Jesus is and what he has done. We may say, oh yes, he died for me. All the while in our hearts, we're going to continue to try and stand on our own goodness and look to things about ourselves to why we should have the assurance of heaven. 
But that is really just the road to damnation. I need a Savior. And praise God, He has sent the only Savior, Jesus Christ. He saved me. Not because of anything found in me, for in me is only reasons why I should be judged. But He saved me because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. He saved me because of everything that Jesus has done in His grace. That Jesus would come and live the perfect life that I could never live. That as the perfect sacrifice, go to the cross and take my guilt upon himself. And that in his own person, pay that guilt in full as he gave himself on the cross as a guilt offering. That he would satisfy God's wrath against me. That he would die in my place, but he did not stay dead. He rose again and he is alive And he brings life to all who believe in him. My friends, this is the truth for all who are trusting, not in themselves, but rejecting any thought of any goodness and any reasons why in of ourselves we should be accepted before God. No, reject all of that immediately. And it said, trust in Jesus alone, and you will know the truth of the gospel. Admit that you are vile and wicked and of yourself, and flee to Jesus so that you may receive his righteousness. And through Jesus, have a right standing before God. I plead with you, trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in him alone, for Jesus alone can save. And when you trust in Jesus, you will be saved. And for those of us who are trusting in Christ for our salvation, rejoice in this as we do remember and are reminded by Scripture how vile and of ourselves we really are, how need of salvation we really are, and Christ came to be our salvation. He came and he is our righteousness. We rejoice in this and are so thankful for the great and awesome God that he has given us the privilege to serve. We should be preaching the gospel to ourselves, reminding ourselves day by day, that it's all in Christ and nothing of myself. And so that I will never grow in pride and begin to think and deceive myself that it is about what I do. And that I won't fall into despair as I find myself falling flat in my face, never getting it right. But I remember it is Christ who saves in him alone. And so, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Give praise to your great God and Savior. And as we think of this gospel, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to sing here in a moment the song that says, Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. It's what he's done. I was once your enemy, but you've seated me at your table. Jesus, thank you. That should be the cry of our lives. Jesus, thank you. And the motivation of everything we do, Jesus, thank you. I'm a vile and wretched sinner, but you have given me your grace and righteousness. Jesus, thank you. And let that attitude and let that rejoicing and let that gratitude permeate every aspect of our lives as we live our lives for this great and worthy God who has made himself known. And what more has made himself known through the gospel of Jesus Christ as he has revealed his righteousness, which we so desperately need. Praise and worship this awesome God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.